morning. morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. We are glad that you are here with us this day. It is going to be a great day of worship. And uh, I'm home from the beach, uh, just as tired as I was when I left. <laughs> Look, vacation with five kids is, uh, it can be a challenge. We'll just put it like that. So, anyway, it was a great time, really a wonderful time with our family. I want to read to you from the 51st Psalm as we begin our service. I'd say to our guests, we're glad that you're here. If you would like to, you can find inside of your seat pocket in front of you a little card. You can fill that out and drop that in one of our boxes. We would love to use that as a means to get to know you. But I want to read the 51st Psalm to you, and you remember this story. This is after David has been confronted by Nathan, and he's challenged, and this is his heart's desire after all of his um, sin has been found out. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth and the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take me not from the Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners will return to you. I would say this as we begin this service. There will be a theme of returning. And you'll hear it. You'll hear it in the book of Malachi in chapter 3 that we'll look at. You'll hear this idea of returning. And I would pray even right now that the Lord might begin to massage your heart. That the Holy Spirit of God might work on you as we sing songs and as we pray that God may need you and calling you to return to him. Because I'm going to tell you what, we can be at church and be far from him. I don't want to start the sermon too early. But you'll hear in Malachi that all of the stuff was finished. But the people's hearts and the priests were far from God. And maybe even right now as we get ready to pray and sing, God may begin to move in your heart and the Holy Spirit may begin to work to draw you into him. Maybe you've been in a rut. Maybe you've been in the doldrums. Maybe you've been in a place of, of defeat. Hear this again. I will teach transgressors your way and sinners will return to me. Let's pray. Father, as we begin worship, Lord, we would ask that our hearts would be close to you. That we would return to you if we have been astray. If we've wandered away for whatever reason, Lord, you would call us even right now. You would call us to come home to you. You would place a burden on our heart that we are weary, we are broken. Father, we want to rejoice today. We want to sing to you. We want to pray. We want to feel your presence. We want you in this place with us. We believe the Holy Spirit is, is resting and residing here. And God, we just want to worship. We just want to take this time we have together as the body of Christ and worship. Lord, would you just... Uh, let us come into your presence in a sense and sing these songs and let them not be about the person next to us or about how they make us feel, but that they be aimed at your glory. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, First Baptist. Let's all stand together. We're going to start out by singing the great old hymn, I Will Sing the Wonder Story. It may not be as familiar to you as it needs to be. If we don't sing it that often, but hopefully it'll come back to you. And we're going to go right into King Jesus.
we will rise and never be the same again. King Jesus is coming, this could be the day. He's waiting on something, you'll hear his father say. Go get my children, it's time to bring them home. King Jesus is coming, and it won't be long. Makes me think of Midnight Cry. <coughs> Midnight. I wish I could sing sometimes. I'd sing. But anyway. All right. We want to share um, a few prayer requests with you. And I'm going to share a few announcements now with you. And then we'll have a moment of prayer. Please remember, uh, we're still requesting deacon nominations. They're right outside, right in the hallway. You can pull a sheet off the connect board. We would ask today, if you want to, just go ahead and give those to Eugene, the chair. Or you can give them to me and I'll give them to Eugene. Um, and so we can have them as soon as possible today. Also, remember, we've got a Wednesday night family night supper meeting on Tuesday at 6 p.m. in Keller Hall. No, that's Monday, 6 p.m. Keller Hall. And then the meals start back next Wednesday night. Uh, women's ministry, Chiefland's women's ministry will start up August the 12th, Thursday, August 12th. Steak supper, Keller Hall, 10 bucks. What a deal. Um, also, remember, we, are, we, we try to do a prayer walk every year of our schools. That will be August the 8th, Sunday at 3 p.m. at Hardytown. We will depart from there. I'll say this. If you're unable to walk, if you're saying, I just can't go walk around a school. If you just want to come and stay there in their, in their fellowship hall and pray for our schools, we would love for you to come and participate as we, um, as we sort of bless this school year. In the morning... Uh, I'll tell you what we're going to do. A few of us are headed over to Chiefland Elementary School in the morning about 8 o'clock. We're going to take uh, biscuits and donuts and coffee over to all the teachers over there. I think there's 84 of them. So if, uh, if that's your thing and you want to join us, please meet us over there at 8. But we're going to go bless those wonderful teachers. And then Tuesday, our senior, our TNTers are going out to lunch. 
We're headed to Cellar Seafood in Crystal River. We're going to depart here from the church about 10. We're going to get here about 10. If you're driving on your own, meet us down there about 11, and we'll have a, a great time. But we want to pray this morning. We want to pray for our deacon nominations. Uh, we want to pray for, um, of course, Pastor Greg, a uh, retired pastor from Pine Grove. He's an ICU, and we want to lift him up. Uh, this morning, we had a great speaker at our men's breakfast. Uh, Wesley White's son, Justin, spoke. And right now, he is in Alachua at a church preaching in view of a call. And so we prayed for him then, and we're going to pray for him this morning. And then certainly Tuesday, our city elections. And uh, we want to remember those, and we certainly want to remember Rollins, others that are on the ballot. But um, we want to pray for God's people. I'll say this to you. Elections have implications. Amen. You're seeing them today. Because elections put people in office that drive policy. And policy affects you every day of your life. And so every election is important. Every election. And so you might say, well, this isn't a major election, city election. Every election is important. Because it affects us. And we would pray that God would put people and call people to be on ballots that would honor him and honor principles and precepts that are important to us. And so let's, uh, let's spend some time in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for the chance to be together with these people. Oh, to hear the words that one day your son, Father, is coming to get his children it's coming to get us one day and Lord I pray that we will all be ready Father we pray that we may continue in a sense of worship this morning that Lord all of the things that are distractions to us might just for a few moments go away Lord there's some serious things we need to pray about we pray for Pastor Greg pray for his family I pray for his church I pray for the doctors and the nurses that are touching his body. I pray you bring healing and wellness and restoration. Father, I pray for our nation in this moment, in this season we're in. I pray for our school teachers and our students who are getting ready to resume school. I pray that as we, um, as we walk with teachers and students, that we would be an encouragement to them. I pray for a good year for them. Father, I pray for our deacon nominations. Lord, I pray that as we have just said over and over that this is more than a contest, a popularity, or an attendance award. Lord, that you call people, you call men to this church to serve, to love it, to love this church and its people. And Father, we, we pray for Justin this morning as he goes in view of a call that you would just calm any anxiety he has. As we prayed for him this morning, we would pray that he would remember that it's a moment to preach the word, not to oppress people, not to overpower them with wisdom, but to preach the word. But it's still a Sunday event where God's word should be open and rightly divided. We would ask favor upon him. We would ask favor upon Rollins. Father, we would pray for these city elections. Elections that might be held throughout our country. And understand, Lord, that, that you, your hand is still over elections. You're sovereign over every piece of history. And God, we would pray that we would be people of conviction. We would be people of certainty when we vote. We would not leave you out of the voting booth. But our hearts would, would be driven and motivated to vote in a way that honors you. I would pray for our elected officials from the President of the United States all the way down to our local city and county officials, governors, senators, Lord, I would pray for these people because you've compelled us to in your word. Help them. Give them wisdom. Help them lead us as a nation. Father, we would pray for revival in this country. Policies aren't going to save us, and a moral candidate is not. But Lord, 
people returning to you as we are going to hear that the people of, of Jerusalem in Malachi's day should have, might, might we return to you as a nation. Maybe those who never heard your name and don't know you would come to know you in a, in a special, private way. Lord, we are in need of you more than anything. So, Father, we just lift all of these concerns up. I would imagine this morning there are, there are tons of prayer concerns and burdens and pains and just hearts that are burdened with concerns they would never voice to another human. But you know them. Just as you know the head, the, the hairs that are on our head, you know our hearts. And so we would just surrender that to you this morning. And say, it's yours, Lord. You know. You already know. Hear us, Lord. And in your way, in your time, you answer according to your perfect will. And as we continue, might we worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue in worship this morning and all stand together. We're going to sing uh, How Deep the Father's Love for Us and go right into 10,000 Years.
chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. Say, where's Malachi? Turn Matthew and uh, find Matthew and turn left. It's the best way I can describe it. Find Matthew and turn left. So I want you to imagine, if you will, you are in Jerusalem. And imagine all that's happened. Imagine the temple has been rebuilt. The walls have been rebuilt. The gates have been hung. It seems all things have been made right again. But here is one thing that's missing. All things have made, been made right, but the people and the priests are far from God. Although the city appears it isn't in ruins anymore, the hearts of the people are in ruins. Real quick, give you a, a, give you a quick timeline of how we got here. About 539 B.C., the first wave of captives returned from the Babylonian captivity. That would have happened in modern-day Iraq and Iran, Persia. The rebuilding of the second temple of Jerusalem started about 521 B.C. Most people believe, most scholars believe that the, the temple was restored and rebuilt about 516 to 515 B.C. I'm getting somewhere. Artaxerxes of Persia. Remember we talked about Artaxerxes last week? Nehemiah was the cupbearer to Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes was uh, probably reigned between 465 and 424 B.C. The Bible says in the book of Nehemiah that in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. This would have been around 445 B.C. We're marching along here in time very quickly. So about six months after Nehemiah went to the king, six months later, the walls of Jerusalem were finished. So around 445 B.C., the walls are complete. And here comes this man, Nehemiah, uh, uh, Malachi. Malachi's name literally means my messenger. And that's what he's going to be. He's going to be a messenger. And let me tell you what. He's going to bring a message that's harsh. He's going to bring a message and be a, 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 a mouthpiece for the Lord of hosts. And it's going to be a harsh message. Malachi prophesied in Jerusalem sometime after the wall is finished all the way up to 425 B.C. So imagine this. God has been so faithful to these people to get them home from this Babylonian captivity in two waves get the temple rebuilt, get the walls rebuilt, everything's been restored, but all of these folks are far, far from God. And so if you would, let's stand. We're going to read one verse, Malachi chapter 3, verse 7. Malachi chapter 3, verse 7. Here it is. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to in a minute read some lengthier passages from Malachi, and you can follow along, but um, we'll, we'll start there. So let me tell you about some famous heists. We all kind of get excited, maybe Ocean's Eleven. We've heard of these big diamond heists. Let me, let me tell you about a few of them. The Dunbar heist. Some of you say, I, you should have got involved in these. That's bad. $18.9 million was stolen in the Dunbar heist when um, some men broke in overnight at a Dunbar truck uh, site and took money out of the trucks, put them in a rental truck, and drove off. Unfortunately, they broke the taillight of one of the U-Haul trucks, the rental trucks, and they were able to trace it from that cracked taillight back to the mastermind, Alan Pace, and uh, they were all caught and they all pleaded guilty. The Boston Museum heist in the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Two men disguised as policemen overpowered the guards and spent an hour ransacking the, muse the museum, making off with 13 works, 13 paintings valued at half a billion dollars. Rembrandts, all sorts of paintings, yet to be located, yet to be recovered. The Antwerp Diamond Center heist, 2003. I mean, these are things movies are made about. They stole 100 million diamonds 
was a band of thieves known as the School of Turin. They broke in underground, under the vault. They came in and they, they, they robbed 123 of the 160 safes. They were able to overpower infrared heat sensors, combination locks, and eight levels of security. Eventually, the mastermind was captured after they realized he had just recently rented an a, a, a office in the building and they were able to connect it. Listen to this, though. Millions of dollars are stolen every year. Bank robberies, schemes, all sorts of things. Everything ever stolen, every heist ever accomplished pales in comparison to how we rob the Lord. Amen. You see, God has created us, crafted us, and made us, and we literally are stealing from God often. I've titled this message, Stolen and Lame, of which it is neither. Thank you for the laugh. <laughs> neither, neither stolen nor lame. I want to read to you from Malachi chapter 1, and I'm going to read to you from Malachi chapter 3, and I want you to hear, there are lengthy passages, I want you to hear how desperate things have become. Chapter 1, verse 6, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? If I'm a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts to you? O priests who despise my name, but you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted Food upon my altar. You say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept it or show favor, says the Lord of hosts? Now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us with such a gift from your hand. Will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. I would not accept an offering from your hand. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And every place incense will be offered to my name in a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it. When you say the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, its food may be despised. But you say, what is wearisome this is? What wearisome this is? You, and you snort at it, the Lord of hosts says. You bring what has been taken by violence, stolen, in other words. What is lame or sick and that which brings, uh, and you bring that as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, God asks? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices the Lord what is blemished. I'm a great king, says the Lord of hosts. My name will be feared among the nations. He goes on in chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. Another indictment. Listen to this. The Lord, I'm the Lord, I don't change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and not kept them. Return to me, return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? And God says, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down, uh, pour down blessings until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that there will be uh, no one destroy the fruits of your soil and the vine and the field shall not bear, uh, fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 13 your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in the morning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. 
I want to ask you these two questions, and then I'm going to ask you in what areas you do this. Here are the simple questions. Have you robbed God? Have you robbed God? And how have you robbed God? See, the people of that day were taking that which was to be sacrificed, and they were taking it, and they were using broken sacrifices. They were using lame and even things that were taken by violence. And they were coming and they were saying, here it is, Lord, here's our offering. And I'm not here to accuse you, but I'm going to tell you, I would imagine we have all robbed God. And so I would ask you, not only have we robbed him, but how have you robbed him? And here are a few ways. Here's the first one. You've robbed God with your glory. You've robbed God with your glory. It isn't about us. Hey, push the button. I'm gonna, I don't know. She's 18. I'm, gonna get, I'm still going to get a buzzer, I think. We've robbed God. We've robbed God with, with glory. Listen, it isn't about us. This isn't about us. Nothing is about us. God wants to be glorified. He wants us to glorify him. All that we do, listen to this, all that we do is about his glory because he is about his own glory. God wants glory. God wants the glory in everything. It's not that he's some sort of narcissistic being. No, it is about the world was created and you were created and everything should be aimed at his glory. God's purpose is to glorify himself in creation. All, when, they, when all the dirt was made, when everything was made out of nothing, the goal of it was to glorify God. When relationships were created, it was created with the point to glorify God. When, when worship was created, it was created to glorify God. When we gather here, listen, we don't gather so people look at us when we leave our neighborhoods or our homes and say, oh, look at those pious people going to church. We're gathering together as God's people, worshiping the Lord. These songs that we sing, I promise you, they're not aimed at you. They're aimed at the glory of God. Amen. The preaching should be aimed at the glory of God. In fact, here's what Paul says in Corinthians. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. You get up in the morning and in the aim, is it the glory of God or is it about you? Often we say, aren't we so smart? Aren't we so wise? Look how well I planned. Look how I can execute. No, every breath, listen to me, every breath we breathe should be aimed at the glory of God. That's, that's what was not happening in Malachi's day. There was no glory of God. They could care less. And so I would just say to you, first thing is, man, we ought to be about glorifying God. Here's the second thing. We ought to, we, we need to realize that we have robbed God with our time. All kinds of folks in here with all kinds of means, some with a lot and some with a little, but we all have the same amount of time. You can't buy time. You can't buy time. And so how do you rob God? Well, here's one way we do it. We rob the Lord in the New Testament. We rob him by, by, uh, by taking away time and service. We take, we, we take, the Lord wants us to be people who are serving the church. Listen, if Christ saved you, hear this real preciously. If Christ saved you, he didn't just save you to do this. There's nothing wrong with worship. One day we're all going to be in eternity, if you know Jesus, and we're going to be worshiping forever, right? We're going to be worshiping forever for eternity, but he's called you right now to do something for the kingdom, and I would say we ought to use our time to be servants for the Lord. Real genuine servants. We, we spent Wednesday nights, we spent over a year in Wednesday night in the book of Mark. One thematic verse, Mark 10, 45. And it says that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so God wants you to serve. I would say this, if you are a person who has been changed by the gospel of Jesus serve. Find something to do. There is not a mission in this church that isn't important. There isn't a mission in the kingdom that isn't important. Just raise your hand and say, I'll do that. I was reading a book this week and uh, on vacation, I tried to read a little. And so I was reading a book and, and here's one of the illustrations. This guy was talking about 
about how his boss would just take the trash out. He didn't have to take the trash out, but he would take the trash out. And it spoke to that guy. And so he would, he would say, I don't want my boss to have to take the trash out. So he would make sure that he cleaned everything, swept extra well, and took the trash out as a way of service. Christ wants us serving. So I would say some of us have robbed the Lord in our sense of service. Some have robbed the Lord in our sense of time spent with the Lord. Can I say this? The Lord wants to commune with you. He wants you to get up in the morning and open the word of God and read it. Now, some of you have been bogged down because in the F-260 plan, we've been in the Old Testament. And I know for some that's, that can be, uh, can be a, a laborious task. Good news. Good news. Luke starts tomorrow. Right? Who doesn't, who doesn't need a little word from Dr. Luke? And so I'd encourage you tomorrow. If you, if you haven't been on this train with us, if you got lost in Leviticus or Deuteronomy or Ezekiel or one of those books and you say, I, I just can't do this anymore. I'm just going to go read the Psalms. Tomorrow morning is a good time to start spending time with the Lord. You need to be committed to spending some time with God. Don't rob him of the time he's given you. And I would even say this to you. This is important. What you're doing is important. What you're doing before the Lord in worship is important. You know what? You ought to make a commitment for this. You ought to write this down and say, I'm going to be in worship on Sunday morning at 8.30 or 10.45, I'm going to worship the Lord. I'm not going to rob God of his time. It's his time. He's the one that has given us the time. So I'd encourage you, get up in the morning and spend some quality time with God. Talk to him in prayer. Turn the radio off on your commute to work. And get in front of God and stop robbing him. Here's another area we rob God in. Our treasures. We rob the Lord in our treasures. We, we say all of this is mine. Man, let me tell you what. We hold sometimes, we hold our possessions this tight. And we say it's all mine. This is mine, mine, mine. I've made my own kingdom. Let me tell you something. There isn't anything you have that God didn't graciously bestow upon you. It really isn't yours. It really isn't yours. It's the Lord's. Just as the church has been entrusted to be stewards with what we collect, you are to be a steward with what God's blessed you with. It might be a lot and it might be a little. But these people in this day, in Malachi's day, they were not even bringing a tithe into the storehouse. God is convicting them in many ways. Not only are they not bringing the tithe in, they're bringing uh, sacrifices in that are lame and broken and useless and they're blemished. And look, that's how we sometimes treat God. Here's a little token of what I could return to you, Lord. Listen, none of this, none of this is yours. In fact, it could all be gone tomorrow. Amen. You know what? I can't, ever, I can't imagine. I've done plenty of funerals. My kids always get uh, uh, funny about this when I, tell, when I say... There's a radio station we were listening to, and there's a DJ in South Alabama, and I performed his wedding for his daughter. And uh, so I'll always say, I married this guy's daughter. And my kids always go, how many times have you been married, Dad? <laughs> right? And then one of them got on a trip, well, you've married 15 people. I said, I've, done far, I've married far more than 15 people. But I can't tell you how many funerals I've done. Listen to this. I can't tell me how many funerals I've done where we stood over a casket and said, well, there's old Ned. Old Ned was just too generous. No one's ever said at a funeral of anyone they were too generous with their resources. Let me tell you what, God wants us to have open hands. God wants us to have open hands. When we support the local church, can I tell you this? You're not just paying the preacher and keeping the lights on. That's, that's ridiculous talk. No, we should be involved in kingdom activities. You should feel like every dime or dollar that you give is going to expand the kingdom. That we're discipling young children. That we're discipling youth. That we're even discipling senior adults. We have senior adult Bible study. And my hope isn't that we're entertaining them. That we're growing them to look more like Jesus. 
You should say every dollar and every dime that I give is going to the kingdom to expand it, to send missionaries, to grow God's work. And so we, we ought to be people who have open hands and say, Lord, this isn't my stuff. This isn't mine. Your kids are just going to go all spend it when you die anyway. And then we have our talents. Our talents. Listen, besides the spiritual gifts that the Lord has blessed you with. And by the way, everybody has a spiritual gift. And so when you become a believer, the Holy Spirit of God takes up residence in your life. Ephesians says the Bible seals us. And that is a promise of our inheritance. Not everybody's going to get an inheritance. Only the people that are children of God. And so he seals us with that. And he also bestows upon us a spiritual gift. Everyone in the kingdom that's a believer has at least one spiritual gift. And you should be using that for the building up of the body of Christ. But let me say this too. Some of you are talented. You have talents besides spiritual gifts. I have some spiritual gifts and no talent. And so I don't. You can ask my kids. I have no talents. And so, but some of you do. Some of you do all kinds of amazing things. Can I say you should use it for God? Use it for God. If you build, build for God. If you bake, bake for God. If you teach, teach for God. Serve the church and use your talents in a way that the Lord can use you in a supernatural way. We sometimes think, here's what we sometimes think, well, I get paid to do that. I don't want to do that at church. Well, look, if the Lord's talented you enough that you can make a living doing it, why not use it for the kingdom? Why not use it for his glory? Why not use it for the local church? And so I would say, Use your talents. I, I, I'm not indicting anyone. I can't tell you how many teachers I've come across in my ministry. That they'll say, I teach kids five days a week. I'm not teaching kids at church. <laughs> well, hey, look, if you're good at it, and God's blessed you to do it, and you ought to use it for his glory, right? You ought to use it for his glory. And then I would say this to you, lastly. What about you? What about you? Are you robbing the Lord of you? Let me tell you what was going on in this. Again, let me give you this picture. It's modern day Jerusalem. Temples built. Walls are up. And here are the people. And the people are bringing to God lame junk. Broken, blemished garbage to be sacrificed. Now that's bad enough that the hearts of the people are far from God. What makes it even worse is that the priests of the day were willing to accept it. They were supposed to be, in a sense, the, they were supposed to be this, this, this group of men who were supposed to protect the sacrifices. But here they're letting this junk come in. And they didn't have a problem with it. So God in Malachi is not just indicting the people of that day. He's indicting the priesthood of that day. But here we are in 2021 and the sacrifices are gone. Right? We don't have a bloody altar. We don't have incense. We don't have a lot of the temple furniture they had. All of that is gone. We've had an ultimate sacrifice, and that ultimate sacrifice has been the Lord Jesus Christ. But now there's also a sacrifice in the New Testament that's mentioned. And guess what it is? It's you and me. Here's what Paul says in Romans. I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So we're not going to pull, we're not going to pull an animal in here tonight and sacrifice it. We're not going to make a blood sacrifice or even fragrant sacrifice. But now, friends, you're the sacrifice. Are you robbing God with all that you are? Are you robbing the Lord of your energy that you could give to his kingdom work? Are you robbing the Lord 
When you get up in the morning and say, no, this is my body, my mind, my soul. This is all mine. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, I appeal to you. Your translation may say, I urge you. I beseech you. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, it is only through the mercy of God that you're a child of God, that he redeemed you and bought you and that you are his. And now he says to him, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Some of you get up every morning and slide off the altar. And you say, I'm not God's today. Some of you might be involved in, in immoral lifestyles and you say, it's not the Lord's body, it's mine. Some of you are involved in inappropriate relationships. It's the Lord's body. Remind, be, be mindful, it's not yours. The Bible is very clear. We are a living sacrifice. So you don't, what you don't want to do is you don't want to be like the, the people and the priests of that day and what you bring to God is just broken, useless. Here, here I am, Lord. You can have the last 10% that's left that's any good. Just as we give to God our first fruits, we give to the Lord right out of that first gifts that we receive, that first financial blessings that we receive. We give to the Lord that. We should give to the Lord the best we have. If you've got a good voice, you ought to give it to God. Amen. If you've got a good mind, you ought to give it to God. If you can serve in some way, you ought to give it to God. Here's what I would beseech you, urge of you. Don't rob God of any of these things. But let me end this with really where I started. Do you need to return to the Lord? All the way back in Psalm 51, the Bible says that, that he would turn sinners from their way. And they would return to him. Some of you have never known the Lord. There's no returning to do because you're not a child of God. Maybe this morning is the morning to embrace the gospel, to embrace the cross, to embrace the sacrifice that was made for you so that you can be a living sacrifice. Maybe today you're like so many where your heart and your mind is far from God. I remind you of these words from Malachi 3, 7. From the days of your father, you have turned aside from my statutes and not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. I wonder today, are any of you far away from the Lord? You know what? It's okay to be far away from the Lord. It's not okay to stay there. And maybe today in a few moments, we're going to sing a song you're very familiar with. Change my heart, O God. Maybe you came in one way saying, maybe you came in literally saying, it's my body, it's my money, it's my time. I sure hope the preacher don't talk about those things. Change my heart, O oh Lord. Change my heart, O oh God, that I might be the way you want me to be. That I might walk in your statutes and in accordance with your word. And that the Lord, listen, the Lord is always waiting on you to return. To return to him. You may say, Pastor, I'm guilty of all of these. I'm guilty of every single one of them. That's okay. You know why? There's grace and there's mercy. There's grace and there's mercy. And he will meet you right where you're at today. And he will forgive you and he will restore your relationship with him. And it would be aimed at his glory. Let's stand and we're going to pray and we're going to sing. Father, we don't know the hearts of the people who are here, but you do. Some are far from you. Some are very, very near to you. Some are close. Some got up this morning and even spent time in your word before, before coming to church. Father, I would just pray in this moment, if there's someone that needs to return to you, that you would draw them unto you. Bring them home. I pray for the one or two that maybe don't know you at all. Lord, we want to be your children. We want to not have hearts like the priests or the people of Malachi's day. Father, after you worked through the ministry of Malachi, you didn't speak for 450 years until Christ.
Christ and John the Baptist appeared on the scene. Lord, we want to hear from you. And we want to respond so that you just have your way this morning. That the Spirit of God might move among us. That these words from, from my mouth might not convict a soul. But that the Spirit of God in this building, residence in us, would convict and challenge and change. In Jesus' name.